Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Pomeranz, and I'm the director of the Kennett Institute. And I'd like to welcome you all to our seminar today, Putin's Concept of International Law. A few housekeeping matters to deal with before we get started. I encourage everyone to stay up to date on the latest Kennett Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our blogs, Focus Ukraine, The Russia File, and our new Russian language blog, In Other Words. You can also subscribe to our podcast, Kennan X, and the Russia File. Finally, you should all visit our Hindsight Upfront collection that deals with Ukraine and the latest news and analysis in the war. For our online audience, um, if you'd like to ask uh, our speaker a question during the course of the conversation, you can submit via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. Well, I want to begin uh, by introducing today's speaker, Professor Lori Mausku. Dr. Mausku is a professor of international law at the University of Tartu in Estonia. He is the author of numerous articles and chapters on the history and development of international law, including Russian Approaches to International Law, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. He's received several awards for his work, including the Estonian National Science Award in the Social Sciences. And most, most importantly, he was a former fellow at the Kennett Institute. So without much ado, Laurie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, also, I want to share with you this fact that this is the Kennan Institute, but Kennan started his, his studies of uh, Russia in Estonia. He was stationed to the embassy in Tallinn and then Riga in 1927, 20, 28. So his, his encounter, his intellectual journey with, with, with Russia, with the Soviet Union at that time started in the, in the Baltic, Baltic states. You can read about it in his memoirs. Um, <clears throat> So Putin's concept of, of international law seem, seems like um, kind of running through an already open, open door. Don't we all sort of already know or assume what, what, that, what that concept is or, or that maybe it's not for him about international law? I guess my starting point is that it is still worth looking at this international law aspect or rhetoric of it because it, um, it reveals us um, important aspects about this war, also about uh, Putin's, Putin's thinking. By the way, when I refer to Putin, I, I, I just as Russia likes to talk about um, uh, collective West, I think on some level here we can also speak about Collective Putin, in, it's not only him as, as a person, it's a certain type of, certain type of thinking in, in, in the elites. And it is an interesting story of transformation and, and transition in that case. Because when you zoom back in time, maybe 10 or 15 years, and you read the, the um, foreign policy concept and national security doctrine and documents like that of the Russian Federation, the, the, the government is always making the point that Russia is in defense of international law. The, the West, the United States in particular, are, are violating it with, with you know, well-known uh, cases that always are mentioned in this regard, like Kosovo intervention and, and the Iraq war of, of 2003. And um, 2013, um, Putin even writes uh, a column in New York Times in, in when uh, um, Obama has to, has to demonstrate what he does when the red line is crossed in Syria. Uh, and then Putin writes that, no, no, respect the United Nations Charter because whether we like it or not, it's the law. We should, we should stick to it. And let's remember that this, this is a lawyer. This is Leningrad State University. So he has, he has studied his foundations of, of international law they, as, as they were already, already you know, studied in, in, in good Soviet uh, law schools at, at the time. And yet uh, a major 
change happens during his uh, rulership, I should, I, should, I should say, because at some point this presidency really becomes a, a rulership, mm, there, there is this famous milestone of uh, constitutional changes in Russia, 1st July 2020, with the, in our context the biggest point being that constitutional law from now on has priority over international treaties and, and their interpretation, which is quite a big, big step for any, any country and especially with a, with a burden of Russian history because we, we know and Russian elites knew that international law, especially the human rights part, was, was supposed to help Russia to, to transition to a different kind of, of um, future. And he gave, um, he gave already back then, when he gave an interview to sell those constitutional amendments, he, he gave an interview in which he said that some former Soviet republics left the Soviet Union with more territory than what they, what they brought in, which was, which was kind of ominous from, uh, um, from the perspective of what was going to happen afterwards. And maybe, maybe only retrospectively now, since 2022, we can understand better why those rushed changes, you know, had to be had to be made to to the Russian constitution, and they are rushed because because some fundamental new principles are basically kind of preamble quality like principles are are put sort of randomly in the in the in the middle of the text of the constitution, which is not how 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 you would usually uh, take care of your of your constitution. Another milestone is this 12 July 21 um, article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, uh, which you can also easily easily find, which, uh, which really um, makes, the, makes the point that, I, I, I'm sorry, this, this, is, this, this parallel must be made, but this is, this is Adolf Hitler speaking in 1938 that Austria is not a country. It cannot be a country because it's also uh, a German speaking, it's the, our enemies have detached it from the rest of, 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 uh, of German, German lands. Versailles Peace Treaty prohibits uh, Austria um, joining, uh, joining Germany. It's, it's that, that, kind of, that kind of moment. And, and finally then, this 21 February 2022 address to the Russian nation, which really kind of frames it more or less like a preemptive action. But this is again, I'm sorry, I, I dealt too much with the history of international law. This is again Adolf Hitler in the sense that Hitler is really saying that, that Bolshevism is a threat. Something needs to be done against Bolshevism. And, and the international law of that time, of course, prohibits that. When you start the war, you are the aggressor. That's why we said, that's why the international community said that. Hitler was the aggressor also against the Soviet Union in, in 1941. And then finally, it's, it seems to me that, that, so he has kind of let go of, of international law um, rhetoric. It's, it's, it's only a lazy one. Yes, in this speech of 21 February um, last year, reference was somehow made to to self-determination of peoples. And basically the point being that Russia is stepping up uh, for the defense of the self-determination of Russian speakers in, in Eastern, Eastern uh, Ukraine, or maybe in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine generally. But that is a weak argument because, because Russia itself in, in, a, in a very very recent past argued exactly the opposite, saying basically that that territorial integrity, state sovereignty, they they have a they have a precedence, so they have a priority over over self determination claims. Obviously, in the 90s, uh, Moscow used that line very clearly in Chechnya when bringing back uh, Chechnya to to the control of the central government in the in the Russian the Russian Federation. And uh, what, what has also been part of this transformation of Putin has been sort of his turn, turn to history. So he has become a sort of 
interpreter and reader of, of history and, and his, his main, main preoccupation, of course, is what he calls historical Russia, historical Russia. But what is this historical Russia? It's really the Russian Empire. Now, the bad news is that he, he goes back to, um, not to 1945, but he really goes back to pre-1917. He's, he's playing through in his, in his head, you know, who left uh, the Russian Empire under what, what conditions. So in that sense, it's really, real, really a revisionist, a revisionist project and, and, uh, and has a lot of uh, implications, you know, beyond, um, beyond um, the story of, of Ukraine. Very interesting is this, his dialogue with, with Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the, the hero of his, his youth, uh, namely, the, his criticism that Lenin and the Bolsheviks were too generous when, when granting self-determination to the peoples of the Russian, Russian Empire. So he's he's um, now you know kind of in, in 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 dialogue with Lenin, trying to fix some of this or or, or redo uh, some of this, uh, so to speak. Um, so my own. <clears throat> My own reading of what has been going on and what is the nature of this transition is is uh, is that that we have our 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 old friends whom we encounter here is really the imperial thought. It, it's that which 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 explains so many things about the fate fate of of Russia, also the failure of the project of of introducing successfully constitutional and human rights, I think they were sacrificed for the sake of, of, of kind of bringing back at least some of the empire. Because in the end, and these are people who know this, who, who have used uh, this kind of rhetoric before, when you challenge um, your neighboring country's borders based on this kind of idea, for example, that Russian speakers should really live in one country. It is, we, we have to call it by its name. In our, in our region, it is, it is an imperial idea. And it is, it is challenging, the, in that sense, the, the foundations of international law, other nations' sovereignty. And the problem, of course, is that uh, Russia itself, during this 30-year or something period, did recognize the sovereignty the borders of, of all of those countries, really, the post-Soviet post countries. So there is also, I, my, my favorite example is, continues to be that Russia and Ukraine had a border treaty, 2003, which recognized Ukraine borders um, in, in, as they were in 1991. So there is a lot of it seems to be also confusion or, or in, among the same people, or, or indeed that they have changed. They have they have changed that that uh, you know they now refer to the change of change of circumstances and and but this this idea of preemptive action, which Put, Putin um, uses in his in his rhetoric, this is a very this can be a very um, efficient idea when convincing also some people, at least in, in Russia, because in the end, the, his, his argument is, you know, that, look, this Western world, they are, they, they want Russia in that form to disappear. Russia recognized the departure of certain, certain pieces of historical power, um, of historical empire, but look where it took us. They, they, they continue putting pressure in us. Where, where will this end? So it's really a um, <clears throat> big historical uh, moment in, 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 in that, that regard. But I think that when we ask, and, and I conclude here, my initial remarks, and we can go to the to the um, dialogue. Um, what explains this? This uh, basically, even the same people changing their view of fundamental concepts of international law during, let's say, 15 years, or how they use it in their countries, is that during at the time of Perestroika, some some le leading uh, Russian legal scholars, they criticized something called legal nihilism in the, in the Soviet culture, and they said historical Russia also had um, problems in this. 
I think it is connected with this uh, kind of use of law in, in, in the public sphere in the country. Like, like basically this kind of change of heart, change of, of, uh, of, of the use of the fundamental concepts of international law, it's, it's easier to do if basically in your own country's public law, um, law is mainly just an instrument of power. Like, like that it has been very hard to put, put limits to, through constitutional law. Um, to, to, to the exercise of power in Russia. And I think it goes hand in hand that the checks and balances in constitutional law are of course different than international law. In international law, these would be the, the other nations who will kind of balance out and call, call on you when you are violating uh, international law. But, but I think the root cause of it is, 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 the, is the same. And, and I think that if, if we can want to hope a uh, different kind of behavior from future Russia, we, we would need to very openly and frankly talk about this imperial legacy, because here I'm also speaking as international law scholar. I noticed that we have, um, we have a lot of um, literature recently about the um, West European nations, colonialism and imperialism, but, but often, you know, people know, Western scholars, of, at least of international law, they know a little bit less about Russia. It's, it's kind of out of, the, out of the radar. It also doesn't help, so to speak, that, that the Soviet Union very, very interestingly, you know, steps up during the Cold War as a, as a defender of the Third World, as an as a anti-colonial power, which, which uh, in that sense was quite, quite successful propaganda, I, I must say that, that many people, many, many people believed and thought that, well, look, there, there is a genuine alliance between, uh, between the Soviet Union and the Third World, whereas we only uh, learn now in some of the rhetoric of, of um, the current rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, that, that actually this, uh, this colonialism and, and imperialism, they are not, they, they are not really alien um, uh, to the Russian thought either. And, and in that sense, we, you know, if we want to tackle that problem in the future, in the sense that not having it repeating all the time, every 20, every 50 years, we have to also talk about that. But I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie. Uh, for the audience on the internet, if you have a question for our speaker, you can submit it via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, uh, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. There's a lot to talk about here in your brief presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about this notion of unity and how important it is not only in Russian history, but in Russian constitutional history. Because the first provision, clause of the, uh, in, in the aftermath of the 1905-1906 uh, Russo-Japanese War and the creation of a new fundamental law was that Russia was undivisible and, and um, was it, uh, one and undivisible. And so to what extent has this policy dominated Russian law, uh, not just for the imperial period, but through to the present day. The idea that Russia is sort of unified, unified. E e even when they has obviously different ethnic origins. Uh, in the imperial Russia, they had different legal systems within the Russian Empire. But there always returns to this notion of a one and und an indivisible Russian state. So to what extent does Putin just simply repeat what has been the mantra for centuries, that Russia is unified, but no one can actually identify or clarify what unity means? Well, I guess unity in that sense means not losing territories as well, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because if uh, um, what was called in the 90s the parade of sovereignties, then of course, if you, if you look at it from Moscow's perspective, then, then what remains of Russia if, if you know, people step up with their, with their sovereignty, 
sovereignty claims. But I, I would simply say that it seems to be something that Russia has not, uh, you know, figured out. Uh, they, 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 I, I, my, in my interpretation, they, uh, during the Soviet period, it was solved in such a way as that, you know, the Soviet Union, Soviet Russia became one of the, one of the kind of speakers for, re rhetorical speakers for the, for the right of peoples to self-determination. And they, they argued that we have solved it but we have sold it within the Soviet Union. So, so you know, peoples in the Soviet Union, Soviet republics, they, they have uh, already right of peoples to, to self-determination. I was recently rereading a uh, description of the visit of um, Kerensky, the, the head of the provisional government in 1917 to Revel or, or Tallinn, in, uh, which he gave a speech which also discussed uh, issues of self-determination. And, and I, I would say that Russia is still figuring out the same thing. He's, he's, he's completely, Kerensky is contradictory in what he's saying is that, you know, we support freedom of Russia's peoples, uh, so you can do whatever you want, but it would be an undeserved insult if you would leave uh, Russia. And that is, that is, that, 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 that some sort of attitude, that ambivalence, I think, has, has re remained and, and now hardened. I think Putin, Putin now, um, in a geopolitical sense, the point of, you know, punishing Ukraine with war is that, look, you, you want to leave us, see what happens. Uh, it's, it's not good for you either. So, but on the other hand, you know, um, to be fair, most, most uh, I mean, all countries, one way or another, they worry about their territorial integrity. I, I you know, the United States wouldn't be happy if, if, I don't know, California or something would, would say that we, we want to leave. Spain is not happy wanting um, uh, Catalonia to leave. Uh, even today's UK is no longer happy, uh, allowing repeatedly referendums in, in Scotland. So we must also say that. But the problem is historical one, because in the past, Russia already allowed, so to speak, certain countries to leave. It was not always voluntary. It was with war, like in the case of the Baltic states, for example. But in the end, you know, in the peace treaties, it was said that, look, we accept it. You can go. And as we also know from the Baltic history, then if circumstances change 20 years later, they, they, they try to redo it. And I see a lot of the same problem in the case of, of Ukraine. There's on the one hand um, acceptance of independence, but later on some sort of realization that, oh, you really mean independence by independence, but we did not, we did not think, think of it like that. So. Thanks, Laurie. Um, one last question before we open up to the audience. Um, you talked about Putin and the idea of respect for the UN and the UN Charter. Uh, as Francine Hirsch's recent book on judgment at Nuremberg uh, identified, Russia had an important role in the founding of the Nuremberg Principles. Uh, and yet, at the present time, if we respect the UN Charter and we respect the sovereignty of the Security Council and their ability to veto uh, various different uh, proposals, uh, we now run the, the problem that th we cannot really adjudicate a lot of the war crimes that have occurred in Ukraine, most notably the crime against uh, of aggression and the crime against peace. So to what extent, when you talk about the UN Charter, um, is, that, is this war identifying that somehow that charter and that and, and a attempt to deal with not only Russia but the United States and other countries that don't abide or follow the ICC and so forth. Uh, to what extent is that really viable in a post-war position uh, after the invasion of Ukraine? Hmm. Well, first of all, let me you refer to this. Um, interesting book by Francine Hirsch, Hirsch which, which I also recommend, but it also, it's called The Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg and, and talks about the, basically the role of, of, of shaping, of, of the Soviet Union in shaping the, the Nuremberg Judgment. And um, here, here I have to also speak a little bit as someone from Estonia that th that, that is one of the original problems that in 1945, 
the Soviet Union kind of gets away uh, with the years 1939 and 1941. The kind of reset is made in a sense that, that this, is, this is not thematized as a problem. I mean, think of it that the central, central crime at Nuremberg trials is the crime against peace. And they have to talk about, uh, for example, the attack against Poland on, on 1st September 1939 as a, as a kind of singular event that has nothing, nothing to do with, uh, with the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, some days before that. And that's, that's really a challenge because historically these things are, are connected. And, and basically, and I think this event too, uh, the, how the world, world War II plays out has, has informed Putin's concept of international law, which is that you have to win. If you win, eventually they, they, will, they will, you know, recognize um, your, what, what, you, what you wanted. And, uh, and then they, as the UN Charter says that this is an organization of peace-loving nations, obviously it does forget that in the end of 1939, the Soviet Union is expelled from the League of Nations because of its attack against Finland. And by the way, it's, uh, this is also connected with this Putin as, as historian or a person interested in history that I think there is, there is probably nothing that he hates as much as talking about Hitler-Stalin pact because for him it is political because it undermines the, the, the Soviet um, contribution to World War II and that's in a way why, why it is so widespread in, in, in also in today's Russia really to start talking about World War II starting from June 1941. Which, which, which creates this tension between Russia on the one hand and the Baltic states and Poland on the other hand. So again, for the future different elites of Russia, this is something that, that probably needs to be figured out uh, differently to, to move on. But uh, I mean, one, one of the things that is very, very characteristic to, to Russian political thought on the, on the, in foreign policy is that you know, why do Americans get to do certain things and we not? We, we are the same. We, are, we have the veto power, so, so, so how come that, that, you know, I don't know, they, they get to invade Iraq, but Iraq or, 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 and, and we, um, you know, we would be then, the whole world would be ganged up to, to, to criticize us uh, and something like that. And uh, how did you mean your question, actually? Uh, I, I, I mean, is, is Basically, I, I, I want to ask whether the United Nations is going the way of the League of Nations oh, if it cannot really deal with such an act of aggression. Mm. And uh, I guess the, 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 well, nobody knows, but I think I, I'm just attending in Washington these days the the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law, and at least among the international lawyers, nobody talks about the UN that way yet. We are not, we are not that far. But it's obvious that if a, if a permanent member, you know, does something like this, then this is also a UN crisis. Mm -hmm. But of course, the argument that has that enjoys a certain popularity in in, in a, a number of countries in the world is that when we talk about like, for example, um, uh, yesterday, the permanent representative of Kenya at a conference of American Society of International Law uh, made the point that this is just one uh, violation of international law by Security Council's permanent members in the last 15 years. So there, are, there have been others before that. So in a kind of making a wider point that, that Russia, Russia is not the only one or not even the, not even the first one. I, I guess the currently, at least the, the Western world uh, thinks that, that Russia is not going to win this war and, and in a way is, is kind of in a way proud even about the fact that still a very big majority of the world has, has, been, uh, has joined those, those resolutions, calling it aggression or calling the annexations um, illegal. Uh, one one third resolution talking, which was initiated by Ukraine, talking about uh, state responsibility, enjoyed somewhat less uh, votes. But in a, in, a, in this uh, basic normative sense, the big majority of the General Assembly 
has called it a violation of international law, which in itself um, gives a certain hope because, because then at least there is a kind of normative, normative, normative clarity because there's no way if it wouldn't be so obvious a violation that, that many of those countries uh, wouldn't have basically voted it, it aggression if it would have been only, only for the pressure of the Western states. Great, so we have a lot of questions online. So uh, the first question comes from Ivan Snook, and he asked, prior to Russia's expulsion from the Council of Europe, what was Russia's relationship with the European Court of Human Rights? Was the Council right to expel Russia? Well, Russia joined um, the Council of Europe in 1996 and ratified the European Convention of Human Rights, the most important instrument in the Council of Europe because it is, um, you know, linked with the European Court of Human Rights. So Russia ratified it in 1998. And <clears throat> that, that, that also was a kind of tumultuous history between, between Russia and the Council of Europe with initially great hopes and expectations, but, but um, eventually a deteriorating relationship where again, constitutional role played a very interesting, uh, constitutional law played a very interesting role and, and became to be used as a sort of, um, you know, something to, to prevent international human rights law as interpreted by the European Court of, of Human Rights uh, uh, being implemented in, in Russia in the way that the Strasbourg Court uh, meant it. I look at it fatalistically. I think that Russia's departure from the Council of Europe, um, it became in that form unavoidable. The, the, the real point of debate was, was 2014 after the annexation of Crimea and um, and uh, this covert war in Donbass, should it have happened already then? Because, um, and, and that still a kind of chance was, was, was given that not to do it yet, the majority in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe at that time did not yet support that Russia would somehow be pushed out. But every, this kind of community, it is in the end a value community. It cannot, it cannot function if, if uh, if, if you, would ha you have, um, on the one hand, aggressions of one member against the other, and at the same time, you know, we are trying to uh, fix issues of criminal procedure or other human rights uh, related issues. But I, depending on what happens with Russia in the future, then, then you know, I, I don't think it's, 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 it can very well be that Russia will return at some point in the future. Right here. Ah, thank you. Uh, is it just me on here? Yeah, we got a microphone. Okay, right. uh, thank you, Professor, for a very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I'm from the Embassy of Japan. Um, I worked at the Legal Advisors Office uh, of my ministry uh, from 2000, I think, uh, 17 to 20. And uh, when I I went to Moscow to meet uh, my counterparts at the legal advisor's office. I found uh, the conversation very well, interesting in the sense that they share at least some common uh, language when we talk about um, international uh, law. Uh, having said that, of course, what we see now is the totally you know, uh, you know, opposite uh, story that we are uh, seeing and when we look back, of course, the Soviet invasion um, or uh, into uh, Prague or you know Hungary or or maybe um, Kabul, there may be some you know uh, consistent principle <laughs> of the Soviet international law which is applicable today. So, how do you see that historical? Um, continuity or discontinuity? That's my first um, question. The second question is probably not about Russia, but about China, actually. So what um, Putin is doing is he counts on, on China, and um, he counts on the, this uh, treaty on uh, delimitation uh, 2000 in 2005. So he made some compromise. Um, he gave up some, you know, 
part of the island uh, near uh, Habarovsk. And um, there is some, uh, I think, uh, myth uh, that uh, China may try to retake uh, some of those territories uh, that they g gave up as early as, of course, 19th century or maybe later. Um, I don't think it would happen. So I'm, I'm uh, in a sense, uh, optimistic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, pessimistic in the sense that Sino-Russian -Rus relations will continue to develop uh, gradually. But what's interesting, and my point is that so Russia violates the fundamental principle of international law vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, but it counts on you know this 2005 treaty uh, with China. Uh, if you have any comments on that, thank you. Yeah, um, about this um, Czechoslovakia 1968 and whether it shows a certain continuity, I think it does, and it's it is again what I called previously the. The imperialism, okay, Soviet Union had its idiosyncratic features, but uh, a couple of days ago in, uh, I think it was in Rosiska Gazeta, there was, a, there, was a, there was an article by Nikolai Patrushev, the head of um, FSP, and where he, he by the way said that uh, Russia has saved the United States historically twice, uh, but in the third time in the future he won't do it anymore. And thankfulness. So you are in, <laughs> you are informed. You are informed. But one of the interesting things he says there in this interview is that um, you know, it will soon be again like it used to be in the past that Russia is the leading European power. So in a way, it has to be the, the hegemon. So it's in the sense that there is a direct link with with, with Czechoslovakia, that that is um, you know, the, about the influence about opposing somehow um, a foreign power that is kind of outside of, of, of Europe. And it goes even ba further back. I mean, if you think about in the, in the 19th century, then the, in the revolution of 1848, for example, the Tsars take the conservative, uh, I mean, there was one Tsar in 1848, but they take a conservative po position. They are suppressors of those liberal revolutions in, 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 uh, in um, in the European monarchies, and again, it's 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 about kind of Russia's Russia's role, Russia's Russia's hegemony. Uh, and secondly, I, I I think that China does not need to uh, change borders with Russia in order to enjoy Russia's dependence on China, because in the end, if it if it comes to access to resources, privileged access to resources, generally privileged terms of, of mutual relations, uh, then, then, then China is already in the driver's seat and the more precarious the, the, the military situation might become or the further away the, the Russian so-called victory would be, the, the, the more uh, this dependency is, is there what I find fascinating as, 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 um, as you know, inter being interested in the history of Russia, why uh, already, like already in the 13th century when Alexander Nevsky had to kind of make the geopolitical choice, who is the worst enemy of Russia, the Crusaders from the West or, or, or you know, the, the Khans of, of the Mongol Tatar yoke, why do they think that the West is always the worst enemy? Because, because this is ra right now what has too also been uh, being decided. And I think the reason is that the, the, this, and the, here again we are speaking about this collective Putin that they find these uh, certain Western ideas of freedom and liberty destructive for, 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 for Russia. So in that sense, it's, it's preemptive not only about Ukraine, but also about the influence of, of, of Western ideas. Because basically, importing too much of those Western ideas, you know, lead would lead to further pieces uh, moving away from what Putin calls historical historical Russia, and 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 that somehow they, they cannot take it. Okay, so we have several questions online, and I think three questions in the room, so maybe four questions in the room. So we're going to go through two questions at a time. Uh, 
short answers, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Uh, the first question from, comes from Craig Jones at Queen's University in Ontario. How do you assess the role and influence of Dugan and, the, and his system of thought? And then a second question, and I believe that's you, Yuval, was the one who... Sure, uh, basic question. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the title of the talk was uh, Putin, Putin's concept of international or something to that effect, but a lot of this discussion was about basically continual imperial practices as applied to international law. So how much of your discussion today will essentially survive Putin? Because even if he's not successful as a, you know, bringing peace and prosperity to his people, he has been in power for more than 20 years. So wouldn't future Russian leaders have the same basic transactional attitude towards international law? Thank you. Maybe I can take this. Yes. Um, the, the, the thing that I find fascinating about Alexander Tugin is that he's openly fascist. And that his, to some extent he's, and he's proud about that. He, in his writings he refers to fascist doctrines and he, he says that, you know, they were right and, and Russia would, would, would need to do the same things and, and, and in order to uh, have, have um, you know, influence in, in, its, in its region in order to maintain its status. Uh, at the same time, what is his influence? I think he has he has a bit been of an augur or, or or someone who has a kind of prophet who has spoken out certain uh, certain things that you know polite people don't say, but in the end will will somehow do. But at the same time, I understand that you know formally he has he has no 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 has had no role in in Russia recently because of also maybe his erratic character or something. Uh, I I wouldn't underestimate him in the sense that it seems to me that recently Russia has kind of behaved, uh, the government has behaved in the way that Dugin has wanted to wanted it to, and. How much of this is about Putin, or how, mu how much of this um, concept will survive Putin? I think this was this was precisely the point of my talk that it's not about Putin; it's it's mainly about imperialism that needs to be need to, need, need to be dealt with. It could be Putin, or it could be someone else. It's it, it, the reason why he changed his mind during his presidency about what international law matters for Russia is that the needs of maintaining the great power status or, or gaining more, um, um, in other words, imperial instincts made, made to change that. So, so in, the, in the 90s, it was necessary and useful to re refer to the territorial integrity and state sovereignty and, 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 and now to some completely opposite uh, concepts. So, so the, the, the point that I wanted to make is that even after President Putin is gone, uh, we would need to deal with, uh, with the root cause of this, which is the, which is the kind of uh, durability of imperial thought, notwithstanding treaties, notwithstanding UN Charter, and so on. Here, and then Grigori. Right here, right here. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. I'm Saman Umar from Kurdistan region of Iraq, university lecturer and PhD candidate in international law. Uh, President uh, Putin, he made clear in, as in a statement, we are going to war in uh, Ukraine in order to maintain our national security and sovereignty and our people in Ukraine, he became subjected to the genocide and whatever he, he claimed. Uh, so at the same time, currently one heard about the uh, uh, ICC, like uh, I mean, uh, warrant arrest to the uh, Mr. Uh, um, President Putin. So, do you think like international law can stop the war, and how I mean the situation will be? Yeah, thank you. And um, record of Ipan. Thanks. Uh, thank you. My name is Grigory Vaip and I'm a lawyer with Memorial, a Russian human rights NGO, and now also a fellow here at the Center for European Policy Analysis. So I also want to go back to the title of this talk, which is Putin's concept of international law. And I want to ask you, Lauri, so on an intellectual level, on the level of legal discourse, do you think we are seeing on the part of the Russian government 
some kind of an alternative original new theory of international law, or rather some poor attempt, some poor performance in an attempt to squeeze Russia's actions into already existing doctrines and theories of international law. There's actually very little legal discourse going on in Russia, in the academia and among practitioners for reasons of censorship and self-censorship, for that matter. But um, when, we, when we look, for example, at, at judgments and decisions of the Russian Constitutional Court, including the judgment on the annex, approving the annexation of four Ukrainian regions, we see both actually there. On the one hand, we see references to uh, uh, classical doctrines like self-defense, for example, trying to justify Russia's actions through those uh, classical, well-grounded concepts, poorly enough, but still. But on the other hand, there are very on the, on the other hand, there are quite some original arguments, like the argument that, for example, at some point Ukrainian borders were determined arbitrarily, and that would, in the logic of the constitutional court, somehow justify Russia's aggression, and that would obviously be a complete uh, reversal of. Um, well-established uh, rules of international law, like the doctrine of uti possidetis, for example. So, uh, in your view, are we dealing with something original or uh, an attempt to squeeze uh, Russia's actions into something uh, that is already intellectually well-established? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, international law has not been able to stop the war, obviously in the sense that it, it did break out, it was launched. But I guess it depends on your temperament, whether you consider glass half full or half empty, whether the mechanisms uh, you know, of international law, the procedures, um, how much they are worth. I think, I think it is obvious by now that it's a, it's a, it's a factor in the war that puts pressure on Russia. Russians read um, newspapers too. The, the, you know, the many lawyers who studied international law at the university, they know what it means when 143 uh, member states of 193 in the United Nations say that something was, was illegal. They, they know that it is probably worth something if the International Court of Justice uh, um, reacts very quickly to Ukraine's uh, request in, in, in March 22 and, and asks Russia to, to pull out the, the forces from the Ukrainian territory, which, which it then doesn't do, or, or the recent uh, news about the, the arrest order of, of the ICC. At the same time, I guess there is, uh, and, and there is maybe also, maybe also linked to um, Grigory Vaipan's question, you know, w what is going on or, or what is the, is the, are they developing some original concept? Um, I was thinking about during the Cuban crisis, the, I think U.S. Secretary of State Dean Aikson uh, had this. Uh, the, the Americans had an argument amongst each other, amongst themselves, about what what does international law uh, allow them uh, to do uh, in this in this case of Cuban quarantine, and and then some people thought that there should be strikes against against Cuba and international law, as Abram Chase has so shown in a book, was a major factor in those foreign policy discussions, what the US response will be. But I'm referring to that incident because Dean Aikson um, um, then wrote right later in his memoirs that international law does not touch the issues that concerns the uh, deeper nature of state sovereignty, something like that, which is you know very Sobering, of course, for international lawyers to hear. International lawyers thinks, think that international law regulates absolutely everything. There cannot be anything that is outside its, 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 its realm. But I think that the new theory that they have is that, some sort of, that it's some sort of historical struggle. It's, a, it's, it's beyond law. It's more than law. Uh, it's, it's more than about law, and law must take a back seat first, justice needs to be restored. That's, I'm simply <coughs> referring to how, how they see it. And then, then we'll talk about, about, about the law. And, 
And I guess they are a little bit encouraged by, by the Soviet history in the sense that it has sometimes worked in the past in the history of, of international law. The, the big question to watch now from international law viewpoint is that how strong are those rules and principles that have been developed not only since 1945, but in reality since 1920s, prohibiting war, prohibiting threatened use of force, and illegal annexations. Because the way there will be an acceptance of, of you know, something muddier will be created, like I remember how when uh, uh, the famous French international lawyer Alain Pellet uh, stepped down as, as advocate of, of, of Russia, he, he explained in a blog post of, of, uh, of um, European Journal of International Law, Egil Talks, that you know, Crimea was different. Crimea was maybe acceptable. And that is, that is already this, this moral gray zone once you start to uh, once you start to say that, you know, if, if, if there is no, like, major war or no shots are fired back, then maybe, maybe, you know, it kind of can be accepted. Or if we start to say in Donbass that maybe in that, uh, maybe in that town, actually, a part of the population um, might support Russia, then you start to depart from the principle. And once you give up the principle, it will be very, very difficult to hold the uh, whole thing together. Okay, so we have a several questions in the room, so we're going to go here and then here. And I see you, uh, Ruslan. My name is uh, my name is uh, Alexander Moskalenko. I'm a lawyer from Ukraine, city of Kharkiv. Now I work uh, here in Washington in the Center of European Policy Analysis. And um, uh, one of the narratives, one of the Russian narratives, uh, which I often uh, hear, even here in Washington, it's that Russia is too big to be ignored. Speaking about uh, your uh, idea of principle and values, uh, do you see um, Russia coming back to international society after this war at all? And if you see it, uh, can you think of any timeline and any uh, conditions that uh, should be prerequisites for such a return? Thank you. And right here. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm um, James Rice with Senator Chuck Grassley. Um, I, my, I guess my question that I think most sort of follows on to the gentleman from Memorial about the issue of whether there is a concept of law or, or you said sort of principles of, of justice. Um, because when you were, you were talking, I've, I've read some of your work on, on uh, state continuity and you were talking about that he's upset that, that uh, presumably that, that, that um, countries were able to leave the Soviet Union with more territory than they got. But of course, Estonia lost territory. Um, uh, because the borders were just rewritten and, inst and, and they insisted that Estonia had to leave along the Republic borders, the Soviet Republic borders, not along the Treaty of Tartu borders. So that same principle applied, it, it, it's, they sort of pick and choose, it seems like. So is there an actual principle at stake or do they just pick a principle or international law or whatever to suit whatever their imperial impulses are at the time? Go ahead. Hmm. Short, short answers. Yeah, short answers. Um, Big question. I think short uh, answers. <laughs> Whether Russia will be able to kind of return to the international community, I think it it will a lot will depend on the outcome of this of this uh, war. If it kind of drags on, certainly at the time of when when something of this drags on, um, and and you know Ukraine in particular will be dissatisfied with with the result with its with the violations of its sovereign rights. I don't see during that time. Um, Russia returning to the international community in the previous previous form. I've been thinking, uh, you said I have to be brief, but uh, mm -hmm. Vladislav Surko had this interesting essay year, some years ago in which he said that Russia will have um, years of solitude um, ahead of her, waiting, waiting for her. So, so I wonder if he was all, he was also a sort of prophet of sorts, or he was he was knowing more than than what we 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 are we are knowing. At the same time, we also know in the history that if you know if the evil gets defeated, then then the return to international community can can happen. I mean, the Germany nowadays is a is a respectable country, um, and 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 you know life after Nazis is possible. So, so the same probably, you know, can be said about, about Russia after Putin. And the second question was, yeah, those state succession, state continuity cases. 
of course, the, the case of the Baltic states uh, is, is different in terms of state succession, state continuity, because, because Putin's point is, is that, as he, as he kind of tries to say, is that the Soviets created Ukraine, at least in those borders. And um, at the same time, this, this, uh, this imperial impulse is really the same because, for example, last year Putin was celebrating uh, some anniversary of Peter the Great and then he made another comment on, on Narva, the Estonian border town with the, with the predominantly um, Russian-speaking majority. He said that, yeah, you know, the, at, in, the seven, in 1700, the European countries thought that it was, you know, Swedish territory, but actually Putin did nothing else, but he went to an ancient Russian land. And so he said, this is my fate too in our, our time. So, so this, this kind of, that is why I, I analyze this as with a common do denominator of, of, of imperialism, is that if you are unable to distinguish what is your territory and what isn't, or if your mind constantly goes back 100 years, no, is not ours or is it theirs? Or is it Swedish, is it Estonian? No, it must be ours. Then that is, that is the core of the problem. Or, or, or the same with the borders of Ukraine. You know, if, you, if you conclude the border treaty with Ukraine has put in signature. Uh, so, you know, decide. Don't go forth and back. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, Ruslan, and then we have one more question uh, on the queue here. So, Ruslan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Ruslan Garipov. I'm with the U.S. Russia Foundation, and I'm happy, Lowry, to see you again in person here in Washington, D.C. I have just two brief, very brief questions. Uh, first question, actually, about those imperialist narrative and ideas that Kremlin uses. Uh, I just want to hear your opinion if it can play kind of a bad joke with the Kremlin opening, triggering uh, new separatist movements in some national republics in, in, inside the Russia. And the second question, I know that you have a pretty well established network among uh, Russian uh, international law experts and lawyers. And I'm just curious if you know about some I don't know, decent voices from inside the Russia, from those uh, experts, or most of them already left Russia. So what is kind of the dominant opinion among those uh, expert community? Thank you. And one last question uh, over the internet. Um, what is your view on great power politics and the discourse on self-determination as a principle and a right? Do you think that there is an equilibrium between the letter and the spirit of international law? Okay. Uh, well, will this present situation, Russia's possible defeat in Ukraine, will it encourage um, separatism in, in, in Russia? I think this is connected with this idea of, of, of what Putin thinks as, as, as a preemptive strike against Ukraine. Is, I think it's also preemptive meant as a warning for, for certain groups and peoples within, within Russia don't think about leaving Russia because, you know, something bad will happen. Um, but many analysts, I mean, I'm not an uh, ethnologist and, and, you know, I haven't studied what people really think in Tatarstan, you know that better, uh, but but um, what I understand is that one should not overestimate those, currently, those separatist ideas. Um, Russia has managed to create an interesting sort of still multinational identity as well, that there are people who, who think that I'm, 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 I don't know, Chechen, but at the same time, I'm, I'm part of this, uh, of this uh, federation. So, but... Uh, but in the end, yes, I, I think Putin is acting out of concern for further disintegration of Russia. So there must be something. Obviously, he, in his position, knows more about those tendencies. And, and they, they, they also know that, in the end, the independence of, of countries leaving Russia is, is also a kind of, as postmodernists say, a historical contra construct, because 
Estonians, the majority of Estonians in 1914 you know, did not think that Estonia will be an independent country. So it's some sort of circumstances will emerge when, when things change. But of course, after nations get it, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to take it back. As, as the Baltic states, I guess, prove by, by managing to restore uh, their, their statehood. Uh, Russian international lawyers, I, I, I know that, of course, there are, there are different opinions in, 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 in this group. Of, it's not a unified group. I, even in my Facebook thread, I, I was seeing that somebody was starting to put, post uh, those Z <laughs> letters. So that opinion exists. Let's not remember that. Let's not forget that the uh, presidium of the Russian Association of International Law uh, made a statement criticizing, for example, the International Law Association for criticizing uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. So. Uh, so there is that opinion that that ends up, you know, defending Russia's governmental positions and positions and decisions. But of course, there is also the other opinion, um, and I, you know, the, it is expressed in a different different way. It can sometimes be in. in uh, sometimes you almost like in the Soviet period, you have to read between the lines to understand what, uh, what the person thinks, but it seems that Russia currently is not, uh, not a safe place to express this other, other opinion, and, and uh, not everyone can afford to become a Vladimir Karamurza or, or Alexei Navalny and, and go to prison for one's views, so. And um, third, simply, well, which nations get to exercise uh, self-determination is always a matter of great power politics. It's like one of the one of my favorite examples is that that actually uh, the U.S. in the after 1918 is relatively reluctant to to recognize the independence of the Baltic states initially. They think now we need to be fair towards the Russian Empire. So so even even Woodrow Wilson, who otherwise thinks that self-determination is a is a good principle for, for Eastern Europe. They, they take their time. They want to see what happens with, uh, with um, you know, Kolchak. Can he come to power and what, what, what happens, what becomes of, of Russia? And, and that is one of, the, one of the interesting conundrums about international law generally, on the, that on the one hand, international lawyers say that self-determination nowadays has become a use Kogan's norm or peremptory norm that there can be, it cannot be violated by a treaty or anything else. At the same time, and here I'm a little bit, a little bit provocative as well, uh, we don't know what, that, what, what it means anymore. We, we know, of course, that it means that there should not be a colonialism, but especially if a country concerned says that, but our context is not a colonial context, then, then somehow we don't know if, if what, how international law um, relates to, to the self-determination claims and then basically this great power politics starts to shape the outcomes in, a, in an important way. Well, I want to thank uh, Laurie for just a very stimulating conversation. Any talk that ends uh, on the subject of Woodrow Wilson is always uh, appreciated. Uh, I want to thank everyone who was here today and online. And if, please w visit our website to stay up to date with upcoming events and publications. So, Laurie, thank you so much. Thank you so much.